Okay, good afternoon everyone. Um, my name is Rachel Slater. I'm the leader of the Social Protection Programme here at ODI and I'd like to welcome you to today's meeting on all you ever wanted to know about the UN Social Protection that I, I want to do is just run through a piece, a, a few bits of housekeeping. Um, the first thing that is, as well as the audience that we have here today in the room in London, we've also got about 100 people who are watching the seminar online. Um, I'd like to welcome them as well. And we'll also, there'll be an opportunity for them to feed questions to Malcolm at the back um, for the discussion later <coughs> on. Um, that means that the world is watching, so when you ask questions, you might want to think carefully about what you're asking and what, y what you're saying. And I, and I think we'll be both doing the same. Um, the, the, the other bits of housekeeping are, first of all, um, if there is a fire alarm, you should make your way out through the doors by the reception where you came in and down the stairs next to the lift. Don't use the lift. That's the quickest route out, down the stairs. Um, the second thing is the ladies' toilets are just outside the conference room here and the gents are down the corridor and turn left. Um, can we remind you to turn off your mobile phones? It's not very easy for people listening online if they go off or switch them to silence. And just to let you know that there's a table of publications that you might be interested in outside. Okay, so all you ever wanted to know about the social protection floor. This is a really different format for an ODI public meeting. We usually have a presentation, a PowerPoint and some Q&A. And we just decided that with the social, f the social protection floor, there's a lot of talk about it and there's a lot of whispering and a lot of debate that seems to happen very, very quietly. And we thought that it might be interesting to raise some of those issues more publicly. And we thought that if we had a straight presentation, we might not get there. And so we're going to do this a little bit differently with me asking Michael questions about things that I don't understand about the social floor, things that I find confusing and so on. And then we'll have two rapporteurs, um, Angela Penrose from the Grow Up Free From Poverty campaign, um, and then Nick Freeland, who, is, who has just landed at Gatwick and is slightly delayed, but he's listening online, and hopefully we'll get here in time to, do, to be a rapporteur. And we've specifically asked them to adopt different standpoints about the social protection floor. And then we'll move into some audience questions. Um, but what I'm going to do first is introduce Michael Sichon. We're very pleased to have you here today. Michael is, uh, joined the ILO back in the 1980s as an actuary and health economist. He served as a social security specialist on the ILO advisory team for Central and Eastern Europe in Budapest. Then he spent 10 years as the chief of the financial, actuarial and statistics service branch of ILO's social security department before becoming the director of that department in May 2005. So he's responsible for writing social security policy, financing and governance issues um, for the ILO and he's also involved in teaching on social protection financing. So M Michael, to start, first kind of the first kind of question that I want to ask you about is, is to help anyone out in the audience or online who isn't really familiar at all with the social protection floor and just tell us a bit about the social protection floor. Where does it come from and what is it? Well, thank you, Rachel. So first of all, if you've, uh, you were told to be very careful about your questions. I have to be very careful about my answers because we are going into the International Labour Conference in less than a month from now where we're negotiating a new international instrument on the social protection floor. And everything I say here can be used against me. So I, I, uh, if I'm t uh, careful at times, more careful than Rachel is used to, then that is the reason for that. But first of all, what is the social protection floor? Well, where do I start? Um, it is, first of all, and I think I'd like to say that, it's the most exciting exercise that the UN as a whole has ever done on social protection. We haven't done things together as a system in times that I can remember, and that most likely means that we've never done it. But what it, what it says is, basically, as a, as a crisis initiative that was taken in 2009 by the UN Chief Executive Board, we simply say, one of our crisis, anti-crisis tools should be that we're recommending to governments to put in place an essential set of transfers in cash or in kind that provide people with a minimum income. And we would like to make sure 
that essential sets of, and services are, go, are produced and made available to people. We push this as a core social protection tool and at the same time as a core tool to development. This is the start of the exercise, at least in public. It's not true because the development of this goes back to the, I, I keep saying it goes back to the 1940s, but the, uh, we, were, we were actually taking universal coverage of social protection as one of our core elements uh, or the core elements of one of our policy up in 2001 explicitly. And since then, we are pushing towards a policy paradigm that in, in the end ended up as being a social protection flaw. And what the ILO perceives as the flaw is slightly different from what the UN perceives, but we will get there in the moment. I think, I think we'll come on to the confusion okay. about different perceptions in a moment. Um, okay. One of the things for me is that the social protection floor is something, as you've said, that's emerged over time. And I, I was wondering how you'd respond to a critique that, you know, I've seen it in earlier incarnations. I remember ILO, Help Age, International and UNICEF in, I think, 2008 coming out with this pronouncement about the New Deal that we needed a Marshall Plan for the world that was going to support people in the context of, of food crisis. And I was wondering how you'd, how you'd react to a critique that it's, a, it's a, a limited group of actors within social protection who look at social protection in a particular way and it, it just keeps being repackaged in order to, to press buttons, whether it's high food prices, whether it's HIV AIDS or something else, because that's one of the concerns that people have raised. So the, the question is about, is this just a repack, is this, is this just old wine in a new bottle, is that it? Yes. That's what you're saying. Well, of course, in many ways it's an old wine in new bottles. I mean, in, uh, in 1944, the world community decided that social security is a human right. And everything that stems from there is, is, is no longer new, right? But what, what I think emerged over the years, and I can speak for the ILO more clearly than for the other UN agencies. But what emerged in 2001, the International Labour Conference said, look, you go back to your own constitutions of 1944 and your, your instruments that you actually adopted in 1944 on income security and, uh, and universal access to health care. They called it medical care at that time, so we've learned a bit in the meantime. Um, but make sure that you now cover with social security systems that these people that are not covered and use this as one of the most powerful anti-poverty and social exclusion, inclusion mechanism that a, con that a society has. They didn't tell us in 2001 how to do this. So we experimented over the years with extending social insurance, which has its limit. Hi, Sylvia. Um, which has its limits. Uh, we experimented with micro-insurance schemes that didn't go anywhere because basically they're not sustainable, most of them. So in the end, we tried to find a set of mechanisms and a set of guarantees that were essential that needed to be pushed at the first point of call in the development of social security and at the same time make it flexible enough to, ha to involve all countries. Then th th what we didn't want to do was to destroy existing mechanisms and say do things completely different because who are we to say that? So what it is and what's new about it is that it is flexible, that it, that it incorporates existing system, but demands the extension to those who are not covered yet. Okay, thank and, you. Oh, sorry. Go sorry, ahead. Rachel, I have to say that. The other thing that's new about it is that it goes out and says, yes, cover those people that are not covered by health care, by income security for children, by income security in adulthood, and income security in old age. And the second message that it gives is, there's no excuse not to try, right? It is affordable. And that actually broke, I think, the spell that we had over social, ex social protection and development and the development discourse for a long time. That people said, oh, it's not affordable. This is something that you can afford when you're industrialized countries or, or, or an emerging country, but you can't have it in, in low-income countries. Okay, we, we're going to pick up on some of, the, some of the things that you've just raised. We'll pick up on the question about cost and affordability, and we'll pick up on this idea of, of um, flexibility. Um, but you've talked already about different components within the social protection floor, and you've talked about 
um, health insurance, you've talked about benefits for children, benefits for the elderly, and potentially unemployment benefits. And one of the things that I wanted to get wanted us to get clear on today was was what exactly does the social protection floor entail? Because we hear lots of different explanations of it. So I've heard it being called a social floor that incorporates interventions way beyond social security, health, education, other basic services. Other times it's more straight social assistance and social insurance. And then other times it kind of becomes down to a lower common denominator, which is just social assistance. So it would be really helpful if you can tell us okay. what is it, because I think that's one area where people get very confused. Yes. Um, well, it's not just people. We are all very confused about social security and social protection. And the reason is that the definitions vary by country and they vary by institutions. So we made no effort to actually, we know what social security in the ILO is, and in ILO, hi. Uh, we, uh, we, know what, we know what social security in the ILO is, because also social security for us is nine contingencies that, country, that people face during their life, plus social assistance, and that's what we call social security. But it's not what the US calls social security, it's not what the UK calls social security, it's not even what the EU calls social security, so we made no effort. But the for us, the message was extend some coverage that are effectively uh, an anti-poverty mechanism and income security mechanism to people that uh, do not enjoy that kind of security. So what we said, we sat down and it was a, there, there, was a, there was a different meeting chaired by Peter Townsend in 2006 when this came up and somebody said, hey, we cannot do this anymore. We have to stop waffling about social protection extension. If we don't call, if we don't define what we mean, we're not going to go anywhere. So we sat down and said, so what are, this is inside the ILO. It's not yet inside the UN. The UN is a bit behind us on this, but, but we, will, we will get there how we, how we sort of align these two. So what we, we sat down and say, okay, what we need is income security for children, income security for people, a minimum level of income security for people who cannot work on the labor market or can't make enough money on the labor market. We want people in old age to have an income security and we want everybody to have access to something that is called essential health care. So these are the four elements that the ILO thinks is the social protection floor. It came out of an expert meeting that we had in 2006, and then it was confirmed by a tripartite meeting. The ILO is a tripartite organization, exists since 1919, and it sets standards on all sorts of elements of the world of work, but also on social security. The social security standards got left behind for a long time because we felt that what we reached in the early 50s as a level of protection in our standards, we would never get today if we opened them again. But our standards actually didn't demand universal coverage. It didn't demand minimum levels of benefits. So this time we said, okay, we have to come down and define what a floor is and we have to put it into some kind of instrument that will stay. And the last time we did it, believe it or not, the last recommendation, as we call it, that went out from the ILO and Social Security on universal, on universal um, income security was in 1944. So chances that e any of you will witness us doing it again during your lifetime are very slim. So this is one thing in a lifetime that we do and be very precise on what we want. These are the four securities, these are the four guarantees. So now you should ask me what's the difference between a guarantee and a benefit. What's the difference between a guarantee <laughs> and a benefit? <laughs> Thank you for that. So what you, the, the idea is, and I, I ask for you, for your understanding, because the world isn't ideal. Um, ideally, one should go out and say, look, these are the benefits that everybody should enjoy, and that's the end of it. The problem is you will never get consensus on that. So what we guarantee, a guarantee is something that says there should be income security for everybody. Everybody who needs protection should have access to a mechanism that provides them with a minimum income. This can be a universal pension. It can be a, categori uh, a categorically targeted. It can be a means-tested benefit. It can be a social insurance benefit. The key issue is that that guarantee is met by a society. And only that trick 
actually helped us to get the consensus, to forge the consensus around it. Because people say, we are having systems in place. We're not just because the ILO conference has a better idea. We're not going to dismantle our systems. And they're historically grown, they're past dependent, whatever you want. So we said, OK, build it as a, as an, as a benchmark into your system that if you have a pension system that provides everybody with a certain replacement rate, and that replacement rate doesn't make the mark of the poverty line, then say, OK, it does, we don't, you don't meet that guarantee. You have to do something else on top of that. But you don't, we don't ask them to dismantle the system. That's why I don't like this. So the benefits are actually give effect to the guarantee, but the guarantee is the constituting element of the social protection floor. Getting that through our lawyers, it's a new term in the ILO. It hasn't been there since 1919. And all of a sudden, here the actuaries come and say, there should be a new term. It took us some time but they now accept it. Okay, I might pick up on that later right. in, in relation to the post-MDG um, agenda, but part of what you've been saying brings out, for me, what is I think is a, a major tension for the social protection floor in that, on the other hand, you talk about defining instruments, but then you also talk about the need for flexibility. And it seems to me that there's, there's a challenge for the social protection floor, which is it, it can either be specific and well-designed, but potentially in danger of being a blueprint, the same everywhere and, imp and, and imposed, or it can be flexible, but less focused, and then it becomes a very hazy thing, and you know, how do we define it, how do we work out what progress we've made? I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit about how you've, how you've dealt with that. You've hinted at it a bit. Yes, I mean, that tension is obvious. And in, in international policy making, we had the Labour Conference last year. This is again, 183 nations saying, put something out, put a new instrument out on the social protection <coughs> floor. But they also told us what should be in it. And one is to say, you want a nationally defined social protection floor. So they entered one consonant to our policy concept, which was an S. It says we're now talking about social protection floors. So we were, we were, we were sitting there with a mandate saying, ah. And the, 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 the catchphrase is, we don't want a one size fits all, right? Uh, how many people are listening? You know, I have to say something on a one size fits all because, but I, I'll risk it. Basically, the same people that are demanding that markets around the world should work according to the same set of rules everywhere don't seem to accept that a minimum level of security for people has to f fit according to the same, has to work according to the same rule everywhere. So I don't quite understand that difference. But this is only a side note, this is only a footnote. In principle, we were we were we were clearly as a, as 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 bureaucrats. We have no view, okay? So we are just taking what the conference says and put it into some form of text. So we had to draw a very fine line between what can be mandated internationally, mandated in quote internationally, and what is have is is left to be national um, ownership. So the line that we could take, and we try to push, believe me, so it's not, if, if somebody accuses us of being centralistic and whatever, it's probably true, but we, uh, we couldn't, we can't get it to what we again get it because we are simply a secretariat to a labor conference. And what's, so what we could take from them is that we would like you to guarantee these four things, but what it means on a national level in terms of level of protection on income, has to be decided nationally. First of all, economically it has to be decided nationally because you can't have the same level of income security in dollars or international dollars in, in every country. So it has to be decided nationally. But we put one, one element in, I said, and it has to be, it has to be defined interna uh, nationally, but with due process. That means you have to involve the social partners and whoever else is a stakeholder in this. So you can discuss this 
without talking to your pensioners, for example. Or you can't discuss a minimum level of social assistance for unemployed without talking to the unemployed, right? On the workers and employers. So that's as far as we could drive it. If somebody can drive it beyond that, we should try. But I don't think we will. And one of the capital that we actually build up in the whole 10 years of process, that we were sticking to the mandate that we were given by our constituents. We were not trying to go beyond what we have heard and what we were told. We were trying to push the envelope in our policy papers, but we can't push the envelope in our international instruments. That's really helpful. I mean, I'm, I for one am finding it helpful to, to hear a bit more about the distinction between benefits and guarantees because that starts to assuage some of the concerns I have about ownership issues and I can understand how you, you might have a guarantee which is a blueprint but then you might have benefits and so on that are set at a national level and that are owned nationally. Um, I think, I think the issue of ownership leads us quite neatly to the next thing that I wanted to talk about, which was commitments. And it's still really unclear to me what it means for a, a country, either in the North or the South, to commit to the social protection floor. Do they sign a commitment? And who are they signing that commitment to? To other countries? To the UN or the ILO? To their citizens? And, and you know, who has ownership of, of, of that commitment? And I was wondering if you can help us to try and understand that a little bit better. Well, so there's no way that we as the UN or as the ILO could enforce commitment. We cannot, we cannot, we cannot, we cannot, we cannot force people to do what they say they will do. What happens, what happens, that's why I think it's so crucial in the whole development policy, we've discussed this now, for a number of years that it now gets somewhere written down and enshrined in what is an international instrument. Because the, the countries that are actually accepting this are accepting to bring this to their legislators and say, please take this into account when you're drawing up social legislation. It doesn't say you have to. There's no way that we can do it. There's a, but I think we're at a critical point at the moment because we are driving this we're driving this for the ILO to the point that we can. We should drive, the next step is to drive this into the MDGs, into post-MDG debate. Um, but at the moment, we are at the point where we can go. We can hand down to countries, no, the countries take home a decision that they have, a commitment that they've made internationally. So, and here's where civil society comes in. I think we, the international organizations can't push it any further. You then have somebody on the ground has to create the policy space, right? That then ultimately leads to the fiscal space to actually implement these things. And if, but the flag that they are carrying is now much bigger than the one that they were carrying before and saying we want social justice. Now they say, we are not dreamers. The international, the international community has said this is possible and this can be done and we have an instrument that we rightfully can push on a national level. That's what, the real, that's what the real commitment is that you can carry. You have to build the national commitments. There's no way that we can do it. We can help technically, the civil society can help, the, 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 the UN can help, but we, we've carried it for the moment to the level we can carry it. Or we can, keep, we can make sure that our implementation, our technical cooperation will take account of that and help countries, whoever volunteers, to try to implement it. Sorry, uh, you know, I would like to have much bigger guns, but there aren't. <laughs> um, I, I guess one of the things that, that I then start to struggle with, you talked about you know, a commitment being about asking countries to take the guarantee into account when it starts drawing up plans. And that seems to me not to fit very well with the kind of background and underpinnings of this, which is all around rights. And it, 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 I'm just wondering, you know, the social protection floor has its roots and its rationale in a rights agenda, yes. but I'm not sure where the teeth come from to do it. Um, should it be enshrined in law? If so, how? And, and yes. who would we hold accountable for that? Well. I mean, I, 
It's a difficult question because it's not 100%. You know, how, who, who enforces human rights? Right? So human rights, actually, if you... Oh, I can't say this. I have to be careful what I say. But, but it, is, it is something that countries are supposed to do when they sign up, when they join the UN. When they join the ILO and they have this recommendation, they're supposed to put it into practice. But there's no way that you, you enforce it. So it's, it's, it's a rights-based, it has two elements of rights-based. One, it's, it's clearly linked to the human rights. And it also requires, and that's what's in the text, it requires that you put down your guarantees into law so that they don't become a program that the next government may dismantle. They have to be enshrined in law and your entitlement conditions have to be enshrined in law, right? That's one of the, and that's what we could, these are the two elements of rights based that we could get away with, right? Okay. This is driving, Rachel, this is driving the international agenda on the issue to the point where it can be driven. Failing an international government, this is where you can have it. Okay, th this one might be a bit more difficult for you to answer, and, and I think this is perhaps an area where we might disagree. Um, in terms of rights and social protection, one, one of the things that it's one of the things that I get most frustrated about in in, in social protection. Because I think that a lot of us who work on social protection have often failed to tap into rights in a, in a good way. And my main frustration is, and thankfully you've not done it today, is that when you listen to people talk about rights and social protection, it, it almost always starts with you, Article 22 of the Universal Declaration. And one of the things that I'm wondering, in a context where people don't always deliver on what they've, they've signed up to when they've joined the UN or they've joined the ILO, is how can we how can we talk about rights and how can we talk about the social protection floor and use rights in a way that doesn't depend on just constantly trotting out Article 22? Because it's almost as if we say, well, it's in the declaration, so it must be so, we must do it, everybody will do it. And I don't think it works like that. And I think, it's so, so I guess my question is, have you any ideas about how we move forward with the social protection floor in a way that doesn't depend on this kind of naive statement about Article 22? Is that a clear question? Should I say yes? <laughs> you um, can. <laughs> um, no, it is a clear question, but, but we, when, we, when we quote Article 22, we only quote the first sentence. The second half of the sentence is about progressiveness according to the means and resources of the country. Right? So this is the whole element with it, even the, the committee of experts that looks into the human rights and into the covenant uh, has this element of progressiveness always built into this. But what they did in, I think, 2008 was different from where they, they said, well, yes, we accept that there is progressiveness in this, in this right. I don't understand. I'm not a lawyer. I, I, I ask our lawyers constantly, how can rights be progressive? You either kill somebody and it's forbidden or you don't. But progressively saying, as of tomorrow, it's forbidden, I don't understand that concept. So, but what they did what, the, what, what the, 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 the lawyers that actually look into the covenant that is a copy of, the, of, the, uh, of Article 22, the Article, on, I think it's 9, um, they said, well, yes, building the right to social security is a progressive affair, but there is a core content right, of rights that has to be implemented immediately if you are a member of the United Nations. But they don't tell you what the core content is. And what we do here, almost unnoticed, we're trying to put that core content down, right? Okay. So you, I can understand your frustration, but if you, if you go back to Article 22 and you read it from now on in conjunction with that ILO instrument, and the ILO is the only international organization who has a mandate in social protection. I'm sorry to say that. I have to say that to my friend Arab Banerjee from the World Bank all the time when I see him, saying you do good work, but you don't have a mandate. So we do. So if you read this in conjunction, from now on, the international rights perspective has a core content. The ILO still says it has to be progressive because this is one of the compromises that you have to make in life, but it is there and we stick to this. But at least you have a clear objective for the, for the, for the rights-based 
approach to social protection. I would, I just don't know at the moment, given the realities that we're all facing, how we can drive it any further, right? I know the frustration, and I would never, we would never, and this is one of the key, uh, the key debates that we have with the, uh, with the, with the World Bank on their on their safety net approach. We would never accept a system as social protection that isn't codified in national law, right? And doesn't subscribe to the objectives of the international law. But it doesn't mean that we can force that onto any government in the world, right? Okay, but thanks. But we can sell it, it to civil society, right? Right. And they have to create the policy space. I say that again. And maybe this is something that we might want to pick up on again, because I know that there are lots of people in the audience who disagree with my views on it, but let, we'll come back to it. Um, I, I wanted to change tack a bit and ask you some questions about costing, financing, and added value. And, and maybe one of the places to start is some, some work that we did recently at ODI about the cost of commitments that governments make. Um, we looked at a range of spending targets, including commitments that people, people had, governments had made to spending on water, on agriculture. So, for example, the Maputo Declaration spent 10% of government budget on agriculture every year, um, on, and on infrastructure, on education, and other basic services. And we also included in that a notional social protection target based on all the ILO seminal work on, on costing of social protection in interventions. And we found that in five African countries, if governments committed to every single one of those spending targets, that would take them beyond their national budgets, even if they spent no money on anything else. And, and I guess that, that's, that leads us to two questions, really. You know, what's the value of introducing another kind of commitment that brings with it spending implications, given that for governments in Africa, at least, there's no fiscal space to, to meet the commitments that it, they've already made? And, and then secondly, you know, how do we work towards a social protection floor then without setting up competition with other sectors that are just as important as social protection? Um, I mean, I was just wondering, how, are you insinuating that you can create fiscal space and fiscal discussions without setting objectives? I mean, what we're doing here is actually putting an international objective, which then breaks down into a national objective. And if you have a national policy objective, the fiscal space would have to be negotiated to reach it. I'm not saying that this thing as it stands would cost anywhere between 2.5 and 5.7% of GDP gross. Gross means some of the some of the elements may already be in existence, but this is if you start it fresh. So um, you are saying that or you're not I'm saying? I'm not saying it is, is gross. Okay. Um, we are not, we are, we are, what we're saying is we're not saying you have to put this down. What we're saying is give yourself, put yourself a policy agenda for the next 10 years or so to get there and then prioritize it properly in the proper process right that's what we do. and then if you see this against the background that if you look at the fiscal space that was actually devoted in addition to the pre-existing status in uh, countries in Africa and in Asia, if you look, you can you can you can look at Namibia, you can look at South Africa, you can look at Thailand, you can uh, look at Nepal. All of these countries have created additional fiscal space for social prote protection between one and a half and three percent over the last decade. And th we have, all we want is a process that aims towards some reasonable overall social budget. And being reasonable means that you don't, of course, there are other, there are other public uses of public funds that may be in competition. But if you don't stake your claim and if you don't stake your objective, if you don't spell out your objective, you never get an allocation in any budget. So this is a process. I, I don't think anybody goes there and say, make a commitment of 20% of your budget on top of this. Um, apart from the fact, and I, should be, I think we should also, also say that, all of these countries spent more than four to five percent of GDP already, even in developing countries, on some form of social protection. But it goes to a privileged group, right? A lot of that. And it, the beauty of this is to say, okay, this costs so much if we implement it, 
then let them, I think one should argue, the, the, the groups that create the policy space in the country should argue and say, why are we spending so much if we can have this for the same price, a universal coverage? It's an uncomfortable position, but it's the only way you can reach toward, towards fiscal position. You will not be able to pull this overnight. But let me give you an example. We started to work with Thailand in exactly 30 years ago, and they built a social insurance scheme for health and pensions for the relatively small formal sector. On top of that, in 2001, they built universal health care. And then, two years ago, in a crisis, they spent the other 1% of GDP that was needed on a, on a limited reduction. Well, it's not a high, but on a limited form of a social pension. So there is an incremental process. And they now look at what is, the, what is in the floor that is missing. And what is missing, obviously, is a family and child level of, uh, of income, uh, child benefit that provides income security. This is the kind of process rationally we're looking at. I'd like to do something more, but it, it, there won't be another chance to do it. We get a universal pension pulled down in Nepal from at a very high age to down to 65 as a matter of a, of a negotiation process. We, and on top of that, we have a commitment to a basic child benefit. Um, we have a commitment for universal health care in Vietnam, which rules out that we're doing other things at the same time because the fiscal space isn't there. But it's on their agenda, and they know what they do next, probably on pensions. And I look at Sylvia because she wants me to push the pensions, but we're not sure about that. So, um, but these are the processes. Let's be realistic about it. But if you don't have a flag, if you don't have an objective in the end, that says this is the minimum that we should reach in X years if we want to have some form of social development, then you don't get the, the fiscal commitment either. It's a process. It's not it's a process that has an objective. It realistically is the only way to go. OK, thank you. Um, so that we've got plenty of time for discussion, I'm just going to move to the last area of, uh, that I was interested in discussing about moving forwards with the social protection floor and, and there are two things here really i mean one is to talk about how this links to a post mdg plan and then the second one would be to just give you a bit of space to tell us what next what you know where are you going from here in, in terms of the post mdg plan you know it, it's a really relevant one for odi in, in part because internally we've got various views and we've had various views about the value of of efforts to try and incorporate social protection into the MDGs that there have been over the last three or four years. Yes. And we've got some people who think it's, it, it's, very, it's really important that social protections are critical instruments to achieve poverty reduction and that we should have a target for social protection coverage. And then we've got another group of people who think that social protection is a means to an end, which is poverty reduction, and coverage of social protection should not be your target or your end. Poverty reduction should, and that's what the target or the goal should be. And so we have this debate a lot, and I'm wondering how, in that, in, within that debate about means or ends, how do you see the social protection floor linking up with or feeding into any kind of a post-2015 agenda or framework? Well, first of all, I mean, logically, it clearly isn't an end in itself. It's a means to achieve a certain outcome. So I think if there is any post-MDG development agenda, it should be perceived as such. Everything else is just trying to build the same shopping list that the old ones had. You can, we're not doing this because we like the subject too much that we think everybody should have it. It serves a purpose. It serves a purpose to invest in people and to, uh, to uh, reduce social exclusion and to reduce poverty and push equality, right? So then please name those objectives. And, but then one of the target or one of the indicators, which is tangible because you can measure, measure social protection coverage, right? So it should be one of the indicators of one of the targets even, where you're saying uh, in order to achieve objective A, you can probably not achieve it without having coverage and social protection 
at a 100% level, at least at the minimum level. So this is where, where I see the logical thing should be. So yes, we would have to lobby in the post-MDG debate, and it's going on, but it's a chaotic process, as we all know. And uh, in the end, it's, it's, it's the same, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's the same marketplace that has been there last time, just people pushing probably wider agendas or more intelligent and more coherent agendas, but, uh, but, but there will still be a big push from everybody on environmental aspects, on, on employment and social protection, will be there as a means, uh, and we have to specify the objectives very clearly. And we have to make the links between the, uh, the, the means and the objectives. But I don't think it's an objective in itself. I, don't, I just fade the logic to see the logic of that. Um, then what, where do we go from here? Um, we, we, need, we need two things. We need to find an international mechanism to keep this thing on a policy agenda and in, a, and in the discourse on development policy. Saying people should have social protection isn't good enough. So you would have to find, you would fi have to find a mechanism that that can actually lead that, or can be a catalyst for that, for that debate, right? And it probably should come from the UN as a system as a whole, because we as an agency have driven it as far as we can. So um, uh, you have to find that mechanism, and it would be nice to find that not just among the UN agencies, but among the civil society coalition that we have around the social protection for at the moment. We should use that mechanism to find a catalyst to keep this on the agenda. So that's the global, that's the global policy that I see, the global policy agenda that I see at the moment. Um, on an, and then what we have to do is finally we have to do our homework. And that means we have to go down to the country level and actually help and be helpful in building, supporting the national policy development processes. And that has something which is very mundane and they're not they're the high flying, the, basically the, 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 uh, the sort of high policy. Uh, um, operation to some extent has to be backed up now by real work. And the real work is we have to make sure that every country has a number of, of number crunches. I'm sorry, you don't want to hear that, but that's the truth. You have to have a number of, of number crunches that can say, okay, a universal pension costs so much, we can, we, we can deliver it. And I can convince the Minister of Finance that in the space of five years we can afford it. If you don't have these people, you will never get it. For me, this is a very clear point of call. The UN will never be able to do it in 100 countries. So we need all hands and on deck that we would could possibly get. And I say that again. If we don't use the national groups that are behind a social agenda, we will not get anywhere. Right? Or we will have the, in the isolated countries that have these development paths like Korea and Thailand, to some extent South Africa, Nepal, where you have political conditions that are actually conducive to that. But we need to build the society behind it. That's where I see the agenda. So for us, investment and capacity building is much more important. Arguing for global transitional financing may also be, a, may also be an important issue. What is not the prime concern, my prime concern? My prime concern is getting the people to actually take up the, the message and, and trying to make the case on the national level. Okay, I know thank you. I expect you. more, but that's what needs to be done, I think. And well, I mean, I think it's, it, it's a very focused and practical agenda, and I guess there are various people in the room who are representatives of civil society who might, in question time, want to say something about how they're going to try and take this up and move it forward. And I think there are probably lots of researchers and technical wonks who might tell us something about how we do our homework better. Um, but what I'm going to do now is thank Michael for putting up with my questions and move across to ask Angela and Nick to just give us a couple of minutes each of reflections. So let's...